Yeah, so I, everyone, I will try to keep it shorter than the, than the original time because yeah, we, are, we are running very late. So hi everyone, I'm Luca and I am I'm a simulation person. And why am I a simulation person? Because robotics are painful. So personally, uh, I, I started with drones and I found that so many times that like maybe you are trying to test an algorithm and then a connector comes loose or you lose GPS and then your drones fall from the sky, crumbles into a thousand pieces or decides to fly into a tree. So it's just very painful when you're trying to like test some algorithm and then like you need to deal with all these problems in the real world or when you just want to isolate isolate your variables and just test your, your algorithm. So I think that there are benefits to simulation, which is okay, making life simpler than the real world when you don't need the accuracy of the real world. And together with also like doing like CI testing. So if you want to make sure that your algorithm didn't break anything, your your change didn't break anything, then you can just like you know run run a, 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 some series of simulations and make sure that your your system still works. Um, and this was probably mentioned by Yadu by my colleague Yadu before already. And like the, the idea is that we can use like the same code in like simulated world in, in our simulator case info and in the real world to make to make the transition as, as, as simple as possible. Um, so like. like the, the, the product that uh, the, the other mentioned before, our open source simulator, I will actually focus on a new, of our new iteration of this simulator, which we call like GZ, where we call the old one Gazebo Classic. And the new version of the simulator is designed to be much more modular, so you can plug and play different uh, rendering libraries or physics libraries, depending on how accurate you want your simulation to be. Let's say if you want very accurate physics simulation or like very accurate like rendering, or, or, or if you want something that is faster but less accurate. Um, but the cool thing about this, this this new version of the simulator is that it also uses this this paradigm, which is the title of the talk, is like ECS or entity component system coding paradigm. Um, so what is this ECS, uh, this entity component system uh, paradigm? Um, it, it's it's very popular in game development, and that's where it was born. And the idea is to structure all your code base and all your logic into three different three different. Uh, structures let's say you have entities which are uh, identifiers for each object and usually it's just like just an integer and then you have components which are containers for data or market assigned to entities to like uh, to like model properties or like specific abilities of like of entities and finally you have systems and systems are just functions that uh, that like you know act on entities just based on their components. So like you know, let's say if, if an entity has a specific component, it will do some operation, otherwise it will not. Uh, the classic example that is given on let's say game development is that is let's say if you have uh, if you want to model like a player, then you will maybe have a health component. So now you now let's let's say there is in your in your in your video game there is like some explosion and you want to like uh, Change the like you know apply damage to all the all the all the and all the uh, living things. Then you would just look at like all the health components and you would like update them, uh, update them uh, singularly. So this is what like a system would do. We would just look at these data storage components and like would apply functions to them. Um, what what are the benefits? Um, so the, the the benefits is first of all like you know extensibility and encapsulation. So the idea is that every single component models a single behavior like you know you can have health or you can have like you know gravity or you could have like you know a player component or anything like that and then and then like if you want to like add a new behavior you just add a new component and that that doesn't affect any of the pre-existing logic so it's so like your, your the rest of the system is completely unchanged uh, which makes it very easy to like extend your your simulation or your software and and also like it encapsulates things very nicely because again, like a component is like a standalone structure. It's also great for performance usually because um, it's trivial to parallelize. Because let's say you have uh, for to to use the the health the, the player health example I used just now. Let's say your 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 I'm going to update the the, the health of all the players. We'll just update. We'll just work on a specific component that is maybe very different from. I'm going to make things fall from the sky that is affected maybe by the mass component of every object. So the idea is that because all your systems can act on different types of data, they can be trivially parallelized because they never have to like, like it's very easy to detect whether they need to access the same data or not and to 
make them parallel if that is not the case. And then because, and then like, you know, from a performance point of view, it's a bit more of an uh, implementation detail, but usually it's much more uh, cache friendly, so that it, it can like perform a lot better than like normal uh, object-oriented programming, but this depends more on the implementation. So what are the drawbacks? Well, the first drawbacks is, is that I'm sure that none of you in this room, or I actually feel that none of you in this room ever heard of this paradigm before, so it's, it's very unfamiliar and uh, it's, it, it can get some time to get used to it, or like, and like how to use, uh, how to write code that follows it, and like that uh, reaps all the benefit of this paradigm. And then also because it's it's uh, it's usually very heavily parallelized, there is both a, a, a benefit and a drawback because it sometimes it can be a bit unclear what the ordering of operation is. So if you if you need like specific specific order, like I want to update the player health because before. I update like you know objects falling or anything like that. Then then could like you know require some further stuff. So it, it can be it can be a bit tricky from that point of view. But anyway, enough enough like um, uh, enough abstract talking. I will I will just like illustrate like a very simple use case that we that we ran into in the in the Open RMF project uh, of like a, a traditional object oriented approach. Uh, and like where, where the limitations were and how using this paradigm uh, helps overcome these limitations. So the sample use case is, is, is simulated, simulating doors in, in RMS. So a door is a very simple object. It can either be open or closed. Um, and then we want to simulate, uh, we want to simulate that with RMS. So we want to be able to track their state so that, uh, so that robots can know whether doors are open or closed. And then we want to be able to comment door. So we want RMF to be able to tell the door, okay, now open or close. Um, so and that, that those are the capabilities of a door. Um, and how does it work? Well, let's say you have like, uh, let's say you have a hundred doors, like each door would have a, would have a simulation plugin where it receives comments, uh, then it, it does some logic, let's say if, it's, or if, it, if it, it was requested to open, then it starts opening and so on. And then it publishes its state. Uh, and then you will do this like once for uh, for each for each door or object that you want to simulate. Now, what, what are what are the issues with this um, with this approach? So the, the the main issue, generally speaking, is scalability. So as you move, like let's say we want to simulate like very large facilities, and like, you know, let's say hundreds or even thousands of dots, right? Um, as you as you as, as you like duplicate these objects like you know thousands and thousands of times, you might reach bottlenecks because now let's say every every time you update your simulation, you need to like run through every single update of every single door plugin, uh, check check if they received any commands, uh, like you know, check, check if they need to publish state and so on. And then the probably the most critical one is a much more ROS specific issue, which is uh, it is due is due to the to this usage to the, the usage of publishing and subscribing because now it means that every single door will have to listen to the comments and they will have to receive comments and check whether it applies to, the, to them or not uh, and then like and then like publish and then publish the publish the state um, but this 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 is this is more of a raw specific issue but it's actually the main the main one that uh, created some havoc. Um, because what happens is that um, because we are using simulated time, then all the doors will be initialized at exactly the same time, and then all of them will publish the state at exactly the same time. Uh, and this actually creates a fair, a fair bit of issues for, let's say, you, you like your queues become full, you lose messages, and so on. And like you know, we, we can get around by like just like doing some like random, random initialization and so on. But that really doesn't solve the doesn't really help with the, it, it, it's, it's more of a hack rather than like a, a proper a proper fix. So 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 because because of all these scalability issues, then I said, okay, let's try to take this gaming, this video game industry paradigm that is also extensively used in Gazebo and use it for to see if we can scale up this uh, this this problem. Um, and and now the, the so, so this is what an architecture will look like. So. Um, it, it's, it's the same. You you will have okay. Let's say a hundred or a thousand door plugins, 
But all they do is that they, they create a component. So, so they, they will just say, OK, uh, every, every braggy will just run once at startup. And you will say, OK, I am a door. Uh, and then and then it will not do anything anymore. So 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 you this this these are all are all out of the window. Uh, and now the only thing you need to run run on every iteration is your system. And now the system will just just iterate through all the components. Uh, and then um, and then like you know like do the do the actual logic. Uh, so the, the the main benefit here is that now you have like a, first of all you have a single publisher and a single subscriber that makes it that decreases a lot the the, the overhead of like you know receiving messages and like deserializing messages uh, and also like in ROS terms it also decreases the, uh, the 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 complexity of like you know all the publishers discovering all the subscribers and so on. But generally speaking, it's it's a it's a much simpler and much more like cash friendly and like much more performing, uh, much better performing approach. Uh, and here, like you know, screenshots of code, but like no, don't really need to look at the code. But in general, like what you do is that again you create a component to say, okay, this this entity is a door. Then you create a component to say, okay, this this door has been told to do this operation, which is close or open or close. Uh, sorry, component, and then you create a component to, to say whether the door is open or closed. And once once all this data is, is created and populated, all uh, like all the logic is implemented in a single system that will that will execute logic based on these components, which would look something like that. Let's say so. For example, something that that needs to like, you know a lot of code, but the, the details don't matter. So let's say something that needs to process commands, you will look at all the all the command components, and based on the command components, you will command a door to either open or close. Uh, on the other hand, like you know, let's say something then like the system that needs to update the states, you will just look at all the door components, and then you will just uh, you will just update the door state component based based on what on what the, the state of the door uh, of the, the state of the door is. So now the real question is, okay, there, there was a lot of like, you know, like a lot of added complexity and this like, you know, very weird like way to write code and like where like you, you populate data in Google somewhere and you act on the data somewhere else and it's, it's like very unclear. So the question is, should you do it? Uh, I will use my friend here. So some would say yes, 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 yes. I hope, I hope like this is familiar to some people. But to the people who are familiar with this, they would know that the follow-up is also no, 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 no. Uh, what some people might not might not know is that there is a software engineering version, which is the it depends uh, version. So the answer is that it depends on your use case, of course. Um, so it's it's very useful if you want to really scale up, uh, really scale up your simulation. Uh, which is the reason that this whole coding paradigm was born in the video game industry because in that case like performance is super critical and you need to like be able to handle like very complex worlds and like timing is very important because you must you must not drop the frame rate or like you know the the, the, the player will be very frustrated so if scalability and performance is what you're looking at it's it's a, it's a very useful paradigm but on, on the other hand, or like if scalability is not an issue and you just want to like you know simulate one or two robots and like not very complex, it might probably not be worth it to like restructure your whole code base. Uh, but for, for cases like you know open RMF, uh, where, where we want to like you know do very large scale simulations with like you know large buildings, large number of robots, and we want to like you know run them over long periods of time to make sure that everything works, the answer is probably. Uh, which brings me to my last slide. Uh, I, I, I don't feel it. I don't feel it would be a complete talk in 2023 uh, if you were not talking about Rust and how it's awesome and how much you love it and how like the world would be better with more Rust. Um, so, so we, uh, so um, we on the left you will see like you know the, the traffic editor that Yadu showed before, but we are we are trying we are looking into. Uh, like the next generation of our like, our like traffic editing and traffic and traffic map generation pipeline that actually is based on this 
on this uh, paradigm, on this entity component system. Paradigm is written in Rust, it's based on a game engine, it's 3D, it's awesome. So if you if you want to if you want to play with it or keep an eye open, then there it is. And that was the end of my rambling on entity component system and why it's awesome. So thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, you guys have any questions for Luca? All right. Yeah, so, so then with the these uh, ACS uh, like this model, and is there a means you can broadcast uh, to multiple uh, objects? Like, um, as an example, um, if you could like broadcast um, in like bit mask of like dot state to all instances of dot. If that would say yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so let's let's say if you wanted to broadcast everything to like a, a command to every door, then you would just have a system that looks for all entities which have a door component, and then it will like you know send the send the information to to them to them. So basically, with with this with this filtering, you already like pre-select the only the entities that you care about, uh, and then if you want to do some additional filtering, you can. You can do it based on like what type of door it is, or like you know, on a bit masking the door as you mentioned, or anything like that. Any more questions? Yeah. One left. Uh, actually, you I think that you had the problem of multiple publisher subscribers, right? So in that, like, did you consider using service or action to not have so many? I think it gets even more complicated in that case because, like, let's say, what a service does behind the scenes is that it will like publish a publish a request and then receive a response. So it's actually even even more traffic going on the wire. Um, while while in this case, like you know, we are okay with the send and forget approach that topics give you. Um, but then, but then, like you know, the, the moment you need to implement like you know hundreds or a thousand of them, that like all like like they're all publish on the same topic. At like at a very high rate, it's like very easy to like start losing messages and so on. Um, how is the uh, how is like the um, surrounding support related to the ECS? For example, like document generation, unit testing. Um, like, the, um, if I switch my OOP into an ECS, like. Like, will they all the automatic support those? Um, no, 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 so sorry, it's a, it's a different coding paradigm. I'm sorry, you probably like you know have to restructure your test. Uh, but that being said, I, I personally find it also very convenient for testing because again, you know, you you can like create a whole world. But then let's say if you only want to test doors, then you only look at the behavior, like you only iterate on like you know these door components, or maybe you can even like only create. Um, like basically it gives you like very fine control and it makes it very easy to like select the data that you're interested in and like you know either read or write it also for unit testing purposes. Uh, so I understand it depends on a lot of factors, but do you have a quantitative measure of how much the performance has improved using this paradigm over the traditional ones? Yeah, so this is the million dollar question. Um, I think in this case, it probably doesn't doesn't like actually improve the performance that much. What it does is like it solves the root problem of um, of like the, the the scalability issue, which which is like you know the, the um, which is basically like the the horrible hack and work around that we had to do uh, because because like now 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 like you don't you don't need to like fine tune magic numbers to say, okay, now I have a hundred doors, I will create queues of like 10 messages and it will be fine. But next time I do a thousand doors and now I need to increase my queues. I need to, need to make sure that no messages are being dropped and whatever. So this at least like addresses that at the, at the root cause. Um, but performance wise, like at least for this very simple use case, it doesn't matter too much because if we are, it's, it's, it's just a very small application of the whole simulation. And like, the whole simulation, like the performance is, 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 is the main performance hits are due to other parts, like, you know, simulating physics or like the robot projects and so on. Um, 
but but in general, like uh, at least from from the experiments, uh, from the experiments that we have been doing with the with this like Rust based game engine, the performance is very is is very great. So like you know, you can, you can easily run like sixty FPS on your browser, like as a, as a web assembly app. Um, and like you know, at full at full like real time without without any problem, uh, but it, but it's still a bit a bit early to say because we have, we like we have not run like you know large scale uh, large wars on the web assembly version yet. 